How's everyone doing? In this video, we're going to talk about Justinian. The Byzantine Empire is not as largely influential as many of the other empires that we've talked about, or that we will talk about later on this year, but it is does have some significance, and those most of those significances occur during Justinian. Justinian is celebrated as one of the most influential rulers and celebrated emperors of the Byzantine Empire. He comes into office in the year 527 at the age of 44. Um, Justinian is not someone who simply inherits his role as emperor from his father. He actually climbs the political ladder. He serves in the army. He was consul for a little while. He's the chief general, all before becoming the emperor. He's well-educated, trained in law, music, art, and theology. And his reign is going to be considered the height of the Byzantine Empire. A couple of things that Justinian does differently than previous rulers and rulers who followed him is the people who serves under him, he chooses them based on ability rather than just simply selecting aristocrats who seek power based on money and their social standing. <coughs> so... He, he, he's always, he's picking the person who's most qualified for the job, so his support staff, his aides, are actually really good at what they do, as opposed to other emperors who it's more about who those people know. They're not necessarily good at what they do. Justinian serves many rules. He has essentially absolute power. He's the commander of the army and the navy. He makes all the laws. He heads the government, heads the church, and is the supreme judge. Now... You're going to say, heads the church? I thought the Pope heads the church. Well, we're going to talk about this in the next video or class, whichever one you're at, but eventually the church is going to split into two pieces. The Roman Catholic Church in the West, centered on Rome, and the Eastern Orthodox Church in the East, centered on Constantinople. And the reason for those splits are mostly ideological. There are some things that they disagree on, and eventually they divide. One of them is actually going to be the role of the head of the church versus the emperor. So whether Justinian has more power or the pope has more power. And then the second one is going to be the idea of divorce. Now Justinian is going to marry an actress named Theodora just before he becomes emperor. He was previously married, saw, sees Theodora and falls in love instantly, um, rewrites the marriage laws, to set aside divorce, which, as you all know in the Catholic Church, is an absolute no-no. So, again, we're going to have some clashes here between East and West from a religion standpoint. We'll talk about that later. Now, Theodora is not just your simple wife of the emperor who's a bed warmer, and that's about it. She's actually bright and influential in her husband's rule. She encourages him, offers advice, and even helps to subdue dissent amongst citizens when Justinian's not in when Justinian's out leading the army, she runs the empire in his absence. Basically, the way to think about it is she is a precursor to our active first ladies. Um, if you look through the United States history, you'll see that some first ladies were just kind of there for the ceremonial purpose of being a wife and worried about raising their kids. Barbara Bush comes to mind. Um, and then you have other first ladies who have a set agenda, a staff, and not necessarily in an agenda that aligns with what the president wants. Um, examples of that would be um, Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama. Um, very strong agendas that they push. Very influential in what goes on in the country. Theodora falls in line with those ones. She's one of the first who really does. Because you got to remember, women don't have many rights or serve much purpose throughout history. Now, Justinian is celebrated for three main contributions to the Byzantine Empire. As I said, first off, this is the height of the Byzantine Empires during his rule. Justinian dreams of reuniting the former territory of the Roman Empire. He spends his reign constantly at war with neighboring civilizations and smaller tribes in an effort to capture Roman land. Um, new tactics and weapons, specifically a thing called Greek fire, um, where they're allowed to essentially throw fire through the air, will allow Byzantine territory to grow to include Spain, Africa, and Italy. So he's going to conquer 
reconquer the Mediterranean Basin, basically. And he's not getting France and Britain, and he's not going as far north as the Roman Empire does. But he does a decent job of controlling the Mediterranean Basin during his rule. Byzantine territory is actually at its largest in history the year that Justinian dies, which is 565 AD. Now, the downside to being at war for the 38 years of Justinian's rule is the constant wars drain the economy. Remember, we've talked numerous times about how war is expensive. You have to pay soldiers, you have to pay to train them, pay to feed them, pay to equip them. Okay, so this is going to bankrupt the empire. So it bankrupts the empire at the time of his death. Um, and then after his death, few of his successors actually share his vision of controlling a Roman Empire. And so within years of Justinian's death, most of the conquered territory is going to be lost or just kind of set aside and left out of the empire. So Justinian's military conquests, which he spent his whole life fighting to capture, are only there during his time. After that, they go away, unfortunately. So as I said, the height of the Byzantine Empire is Justinian's rule. Contributions to the public. Justinian is constructs numerous roads, bridges, forms, and churches to make the lives of Byzantines better. Okay, a lot of infrastructure and churches. He's a very pious man, builds churches. The most important one that you need to know is known as the Hagia Sophia which is an extremely large Christian church at the time. Um, they take an old church that had existed, it was already a big church, and they renovate it and make it massive. It's architecturally representative of Greco-Roman culture, and it's decorated with beautiful mosaics. All right, so the Hagia Sophia is a demonstration of Greco-Roman culture linked together in a couple of pictures. As she stands today, You'll archi we'll talk about this again in future lessons, but architecturally, one of the big contributions of the Byzantines is the dome with the spire. We had columns from Greece, arches from Rome, domes from the Byzantines. And if you look, an example of our mosaics here, inside, just to give you an idea of the scope and scale, that is a person, that little thing right there. So just, just to give you some clue as to how massive the inside of the Hagia Sophia is. Now, the Hagia Sophia is not the most sound play from an engineering standpoint, um, and there is earthquake activity in that area, so it has suffered earthquake damage over the years. The building's eventually going to be converted into a mosque when the Turks conquer the Byzantine Empire, um, and today it stands as a museum with many depictions of not just Islamic art um, and Islamic, Islamic representations, but also you can still get through to the Christian ones. It is actually a museum to both religions, a place where both religions can go and get along. Now, Justinian's best known, most important contribution has to be his codification of Greek and Roman laws. Okay, He spends six years simplifying tens of thousands of Greek and Roman laws into just four sections. So he takes thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of laws and boils them down into something simple. This guy needs to come back to life for a year or two and boil down the U.S. code and the U.S. tax code because they are equally as complicated and ridiculous. All right, contributions to law. You need to know all four of these. The first one, the code, are the actual laws. The second part, the digest, is a careful examination of previous rulings and cases to guide judges. Okay, this is where we get the idea of legal precedent. All right, the idea of legal precedent comes from there. And what legal precedent is, is currently in the United States system, we have this case where judges have to follow the rulings of other judges in similar cases. So lawyers have to research previous court rulings if there is a decision that a judge has to make, uh, whether evidence should be allowed or not, or whether a search was proper. They go back and they research previous case laws and they find 
cases that were very similar to the one that they're arguing right now, and the judge has to follow precedent. So um, the, the biggest example of that, and the only court that can overturn precedent in the United States is the Supreme Court. But a good example is Brown versus the Board of Education, where the Supreme Court, all the lower courts would not overturn Plessy versus Ferguson, which ruled that separate but equal and le racial segregation was okay. It finally got to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court went and overturned that. So all the lower courts have to follow previous rulings of other judges. Um, the third section are known as the institutions, which are a textbook for law students. Um, the fourth section are novels, which are enacted after Justinian's Code was created, so it's just a place where they keep the remaining laws as they come in. Um, just a couple of things here, Justinian's Code, so you can compare and contrast them. As you guys, as we've gone forward, you've started to see with our different law codes, Hammurabi, the Ten Commandments, eventually the Twelve Tables, we've started to have law codes that resemble more closely what our principles here in the United States are. So let's go ahead and look. In Justinian's Code, women can actually own property, make contracts, and write a will, and they can bring a lawsuit. Women, you have rights. Congratulations. Among the first times in history. American laws. All women basically have the same rights as men. So in, uh, women's rights in Justinian's Code are better. They're not universal all rights like in American laws, but they're getting better. Here's an interesting one. Um, in Justinian's Code, robbery is actually not a criminal offense. Now, the victim can sue the robber for up to four times the value of a stolen property. So if I steal an iPhone that's valued at $700, the police don't spend their time investigating it. They don't spend their time searching for evidence to convict me and throw me in jail. But the person who I stole it from can get a private detective to come up with all that evidence. And if they can prove that I stole it, they can sue me for $2,800, four times the value of that iPhone, and win. Under American law, robbery is a crime. You get punished by fine and prison sentence, and the police are the ones who investigate it. Um, failure to pay debts. In Justinian's Code, if someone owes you money, you have to sue them to get the debt back. It's funny, because that's exactly how it is under American laws. You guys ever watch Judge Judy? That's usually what's going on. Under Justinian's Code, murder is punished by banishment. They don't waste the time imprisoning murderers. They don't waste the money executing them. They just say, get out. Leave and never come back. In the United States, we either imprison them or we execute them, depending upon which state you're in. Not every state has the death penalty. Virginia is one of them. We are actually number two in frequency of executions. Inheritance. Women cannot inherit property from their husbands unless it's provided sp specifically in a will. Children will receive equal amounts of the father's estate. Under American laws, the wives would inherit it before it gets sent to the children. So if you're married, um, your husband dies, and you become a widow under Justinian's code, unless your husband wrote a will giving you the money, that money goes to your kids, and it's on your kids to take care of you. Under U.S. law, it goes to the wife first, and then when the wife dies, it would go to the kids. So those are just some similarities and some differences. I, I want you guys to pay attention. Again, we continue to get closer to what American law is as we've moved forward throughout history.